From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's Just the Tip Stirs with Melissa Morgan. Nipple balm. <laughs> Remember, if you've got a tip for Melissa, an old phone number that haunts you for no apparent reason, a note that fell out of an old book in the used bookstore, how to keep smiling while listening to your boss brag about his brat 10 year old taking third place at the fifth grade spelling bee, anything, tell us about it by calling the Tipster Hotline at 832 Tipster. That's 832 847 7837, or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. And now here's your host, fighting serial killers and telemarketers with equal outrage, Melissa Morgan. <gasps> More cowbell. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm not much on third place. Yeah. Wonder what the word was in this belly bee. I the, the, the on disqualified. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, probably like that. So I'm happy I made you uh, laugh at nipple balm. Yeah. What? And uh, I, apparently I have some splaining to do. Yeah. Where the hell did that come from? Well, it comes from a company. Um, yeah. I, I, it's called Doctor Somebody. I think it's Doctor Lip L I P P, which is even funnier. Um, <laughs> and it comes in a tiny, tiny tube. And yeah. um, apparently women maybe who are breastfeeding and their poor nips get chapped or something. Yeah. You're, you're supposed to be able to put it on there, but it's actually f for your lips too, but they actually call it like Dr. Lips nipple balm. And I, <laughs> I know, what? I know I ordered it online and it arrived and I was like, <laughs> well, I'll be goddamn. That's exactly what it says on the package. Sounds and... like a Dr. Hook album from 1973. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lips nipple balm. It's yeah. in, it, and here's the thing. You can't buy it like one at a time. You, uh, they give you two. Oh, well. So I have like one next to the nightstand and one like in my car. And it really is very moisturizing for yeah. your, I, I don't put it on on my nether regions, but I do put it on my you, mouth. You do. I'm, I'm saying you're not just out there, you know, doing, uh, putting bombing, in, bombing your nips. No. no, or your own or my own. No, uh, no. In the car. No, I've never had, um, I, I did see something I thought was funny one time. Probably happens more to, to the gentlemen who might be listening, both of them. Um, I guess if you're like a, maybe like a marathon runner, it, it, it makes sense. You're moving, you're wearing a shirt that's probably made of a, odd material yeah. like, to wick away sweat and apparently your nips get chapped like I, they get I, painful i could could see that i know i don't want to see it but um, i can yeah. i understand it yeah why did this happen i don't know why this happens every time we try to start a podcast we're always talking about it's something terrible <laughs> you're the one that said it's my nipple fault. bomb it's this my fault. time it just happened to be on my mind i'm oh, i'm sorry yeah. I, it's like I just it, say things out. Like, Nipple bomb. You're usually saying. I'm like Rain Man. Nipple bomb. <laughs> Definitely nipple bomb. Yeah. I mean, what was the what was the one you you from the from the swearing c series that you said at the top of one of these podcasts? The swearing season. Uh, yeah. Or the, swearing the, the, you know the history of of swear oh, words or whatever. Yeah. The, I can't. God knows what the, I. Who, I can't the, remember. It was the old the old uh, like eighteenth nineteenth century uh, term for. Oh, that's uh, right. Yeah. I can't remember her name. Yeah, I can't remember her name. Either. Gretchen Twat Waffle or something. I can't. It's not that, but it was something similar. I said something terrible. I'm sure <laughs> it made you laugh until you cough. Oh my! This is a terrible podcast. I don't, I don't Why would a, anyone listen to this bullshit? I don't, Why? I don't, I don't have a button to prevent me from from coughing. A cough button? To, I don't have a cough button so that everybody hears me cough when you. Make. Why are we not investing in cough buttons? Oh, we'll get one All eventually. Right. All right. Yeah. Um. So while I'm going down just a terrible path, I'm going to try and elevate this by saying thank you to our amazing tipsters for the reviews that you're leaving that are just just so priceless and help other people find us. If you have the time, please go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening to us now and give us a rating that you think is fair. Please make it a good one. And a review if you have time. And we want to take a special... Um, time to say thank you to Barkley Mom, and we are looking into the case that she suggested, which you can always do that in a review, but I would much prefer you send us an email. I'll give you the email address in a moment. And thank you so much to Matilda, who I guess is a local Santa Clarita resident, and just the nicest review 
and she found us when she was sounds like when she was looking um for information on the will sarazon case which uh i am going to uh court <laughs> i didn't do anything bad as far as you know i'm going to court again uh tuesday the 23rd which ironically will be the day that this episode will be available and is the anniversary of the disappearance of the person we'll be speaking of but matilda Ooh, that's right now yeah, a lot that. happening on tuesday the 23rd of march 2021 Uh, Matilda left us a lovely review and said that she was a local person and that she had just really wanted to hear information on the one case she was looking for, but she now is hooked on the podcast. And that just means everything to us, Matilda. It's, it's one of those things where, um, producer Mark had looked at the, you know, analytics for who listens to this podcast and a large number of people listen from my hometown in the Cincinnati area, which was Uh, lovely and somewhat shocking. It's not like I had a huge number of friends there, but a couple of cases that we've discussed in that, in the area, um, people are apparently listening, which is really nice. And then the second, uh, city with the highest number of listens is Los Angeles, which was really interesting to me, but I, I don't know that we've ever gotten a review, uh, from someone in our wonderful hometown of uh, our our now hometown of Santa Clarita, we're getting really really wonderful reviews from all over. From and this all one, over, this one was really it was very sweet, really nice. I was very very grateful. So thank you, Matilda, for that. And we have a new uh, YouTube subscriber, uh, John Tipster John, who um, I am grateful that he subscribed. And uh, I don't understand you kids and your YouTubies, but. You know, God bless you. I spent a lot of time on YouTube watching um, makeup videos and Dollar Tree hauls. So that's where, you know, where my brain and and how to apply nipple balm correctly. That's always important. I think it is very, very important. So we have a promo from our friends at Corpus Delecti, and they are covering uh, an unusual case for them. They're doing a multi-part series on a man who may be wrongfully convicted. So here's the promo for that. Here in Alabama, a man named Robin Rocky Myers sits on death row, where he's been since 1993 after being convicted of capital murder. His appeals have run out, and he's awaiting an execution date. There's just one major problem. Rocky might be innocent. Road to Redemption is the new multi-part miniseries on Corpus Delicti. We will take you through his story. The lack of evidence, witness tampering, likely jury bias, overridden sentence, being abandoned by his attorney, and a highly debated intellectual disability. You will hear from his lawyer, investigator, and others involved in Rocky's fight. And that's where you come in. We need your help. Rocky's last hope? the governor of Alabama. Join us, Jen and Lindsay, the host of Corpus Delicti, as we aim to bring this case to her attention. Find Corpus Delicti on your favorite podcast app by searching C-O-R-P-U-S-D-E-L-I-C-T-I. Episodes release weekly, so join us on Tuesdays starting March 9th to hear Rocky's story. See you soon. The girls at Corpus Delecti do a a good work, and this is something, it's a departure for them. So uh, tune into that podcast because they they are working hard to try and get some help for Rocky, which is a good thing. So if you have an idea for a case you would like us to cover, or even if you just want to email us about anything you want us to know, please feel free to use jttipsters at gmail.com. And you can always call us on the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837. We love hearing from the Tipsters for any reason, but we are always very grateful if there's a case you want us to cover or look into for any reason. We're grateful to hear from our Tipsters. There are sometimes quotes that come up that are meaningful in a case that we're covering. And I felt like this was a very uh, appropriate one for Austin J. Smith's case. And it is a quote from Elie Wiesel. And he said, What hurts the victim most is not the cruelty of the oppressor, but the silence of the bystander. 
Now, one of the things I love about Elie Wiesel is that he was listed as a writer, professor, Nobel laureate, and Holocaust survivor. And Holocaust survivor was the last thing he wanted you to know about him because he overcame so much. And he still, until he passed, believed that the oppressors, while what they did was terrible, the people that didn't do anything to stop that were worse. The cruelty of of a silent bystander. And we know in Jay's case, even though his name is Austin J. Smith, he always went by Jay with friends and family. We know in Jay's case, there are more than one bystander who knows what happened, who has an idea of what happened. And Detective Lopez of the LA County Sheriff's Department, Cold Case Division, has had Jay's case since 2013. And on Tuesday, March 23rd of 2021, it will be the 28th anniversary of Jay's disappearance. And we will assume that Jay is no longer with us because of this anniversary and because Detective Lopez is working hard and trying to get answers for Jay's family and loved ones. This case was recently profiled on our local CBS Channel 2 And here is a clip from an interview with Detective Lopez. Teddy Smith's baby brother, Austin J. Smith, walked out of the El Monte home he shared with his mother on March 23rd, 1993. And that would be the last time his family saw the 23-year-old aspiring accountant. Detective Richard Lopez from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department's cold case unit took over Jay's case in 2013. By that time, the missing persons investigation had turned into a homicide investigation. So we'll hear from Detective Lopez a little bit later. That was Rachel Kim from CBS Local 2. She did a wonderful job of covering Jay's case. There's some great information from the San Gabriel Valley Tribune by a wonderful crime reporter named Brian Day. The Los Angeles Times covered this story. And we're talking about a case that's 28 years old and yet still seems very fresh in the minds of the family and loved ones of Jay Smith. So Jay is a 23-year-old man who lived in El Monte, which is in the San Gabriel Valley, uh, part of Southern California. And he was your typical 23-year-old who looks just like what you would want your brother, your son your boyfriend, your friend to look like. Just the sweetest, open-faced kid. He's like a poster child. Um, Blonde hair, blue eyes, just like the sweetest face you've ever seen. And he was had a lot on his shoulders for the age of 23. His father had passed away unexpectedly a year before, and he's the youngest of five. And he not only had a full-time job at a savings and loan, was also a student at Citrus College studying to get a degree in accounting. He worked side jobs. He had side hustles to help support his mother, who was unexpectedly and recently widowed. And he still lived at home to help take care of her. One of his side jobs was as a DJ. And he had an appointment that he made sure a few people knew about, which I think is a smart thing to do, especially if you're going to meet someone that you know you've had beef with in the past. And that is one of the questions I have about this is, why did Jay walk into this, what felt like a trap, but he must have had information that made it seem that he was going to be okay. So at 8.30 on the evening of March 23rd of 1993, Jay is going to meet with a former employer. Now, his name wasn't mentioned in the CBS Local 2 article, but his name is out there, and we're going we're gonna to say his name. His name is Alexander Malinowski. He still lives in the San Gabriel Valley. He still works in the San Gabriel Valley, has um, a family and a home, and yeah. So he is still there. He is still living his life, and as we know, Jay's family knows that Jay is not living his life any longer. And we know Alexander is the last person, potentially, to have seen Jay alive. So at 8.30, he was meeting Alexander Malinowski at the Rosemead High School Auditorium in Rosemead, another part of the San Gabriel Valley. And 
he was going to borrow some equipment for his side hustle, for his DJ gig. And it did not go well. Something happened because Jay never was seen again. Now, he did the right thing. If you're going to meet someone that maybe you're, you have some doubts about, make sure other people know. His mother and his girlfriend knew where he was going. And they had reservations, but he apparently thought he was going to be okay. Around 10 or 10.30, after what should have been enough time for him to have gotten the equipment, Jay's girlfriend made a trip to the Rosemead High School Auditorium. And of course, the school is closed, all the doors are locked, but she bangs on the door of the auditorium. And Alexander Malinowski answers the door, looking very agitated and disheveled. And when he sees it's her and she says, I'm looking for Jay, he hasn't come home, Alexander Malinowski slams the door in her face and she's locked out. She notices that Jay's 1992 Mazda pickup truck is parked right next to Alexander Malinowski's pickup truck, which has a camper on the back. A camper that could hide all sorts of things or house all sorts of things. She drives around looking for Jay in case he's walked away, maybe to clear his head. He's still can't be found. A little later, she drives around the parking lot again, noticing that Jay's truck is missing, but Malinowski's truck is still there. So when she was there the first time, when he slammed the door in her face, Jay's truck was there. They were. Both trucks were there. Both of them were there. And Parked she, next to each other. And then she goes back a little later, and Jay's truck is gone, but Malinowski's truck is still there. Yes. Okay. And... She and his mother, Jay's mother, decide we need help. We need to report him missing. By the time that they start looking for Jay, his truck is found the following morning, parked behind a dumpster about four blocks away from the Rosemead High School. Um, There's no evidence in the truck that anything happened, no forced entry, no blood, nothing like that. His truck is there, and I will tell you that I spoke with Detective Lopez and asked, you know, the dumbest question, but I had to. Was the dumpster checked to see if Jay was there? And he said absolutely everything had been looked through. Now, they know immediately there's an issue. Jay is, as his sister Teddy says in the interview on CBS Local 2, is not the guy who would walk away from his life. He had nothing to walk away from. His life was, you know, a lot on his plate for a 23-year-old, but he had a great life. He loved his mother. He loved his girlfriend. He loved school. He loved his job. He was an ambitious young man who worked, you know, several side gigs to help support his mother and to better himself and his life. He was just, just a good kid all the way around a good kid. He had nothing to walk away from. Nothing. To walk away from. So they investigate, obviously looking through the auditorium. Uh, they speak with Alexander Malinowski, who's like, no, he left. He walked out sometime around 10. I don't know. They find a small amount of blood in the auditorium. And unfortunately, that got discarded accidentally. Oh, no. By, by the cops? Yes. Ooh. I don't, I will be honest, I don't know if it was from the El Monte Police Department, which was also involved, or the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, but I do know that that evidence is missing or was accidentally destroyed. Oh, man. But they have other evidence. And honestly, a small amount of blood, you know, I hate to say this and give anyone any sort of excuses, but an attorney, any attorney with their salt could say, oh, you know what? They got in a fight and uh, Jay got a nosebleed. It could be easily explained or it could be, you know, uh, it was uh, Jay had a cut on his hand. It, it, there's lots of explanations for a small amount of blood that would have been helpful to have. But let's just say they needed a lot more for sure. And I believe they have it. And times are Times are different now. It's not 1993, and you'll understand what I'm what I'm saying. A barrel that was used for stage productions, and Alexander Malinowski was the auditorium manager. 
in charge of all of these things. A barrel is missing. A barrel that could potentially hold a five foot six, 140 pound male who, who has never been seen again. Okay. But also more interestingly than the barrel is what else went missing, which is Malinowski. The day after Jay's disappearance, Malinowski disappeared for two weeks, along with his truck and his camper. For two weeks? Two weeks. It was an unscheduled, uh, unqualified disappearance. He didn't tell his employers. No one knew where he was. He was gone for two weeks, (laughs) along Uh, with a barrel, along with Jay. uh, Yeah. Who knows where he could be? I... Uh, asked a lot of questions. Detective Lopez was more than open and honest. Um, you know, how would you track uh, mileage? Um, you know, ninety three were a lot of people using cell phones. Did they have them? I don't. I don't know. Um, Not a lot, right? Not a lot. Yeah. So it, he had two weeks to do whatever. Now. What else is interesting is that his story has changed at least three times. They always say, if you tell the truth, your story remains the same. That's, you know, that can be debated also after a long time, maybe things change. But you know what? When three stories come out of the main uh, person who last saw Jay alive, as far as we know, when those stories change, that does bring doubt into the picture. So one of the articles that I found from the San Gabriel Valley Tribune, which was so well done by Brian Day, he said that they had tried to make contact with Alexander Malinowski and a young male answered the phone at his home when they called. And the young male said, uh, he's not available to, uh, for any kind of comment. And then he said, we've dealt with this thing long enough. We don't want anything to do with it anymore. Well, you know. Well, so it was a young man's voice. Do we know if it was Malinowski himself or somebody else? No, they believe it was a family member. That's all I'm going to say. They believe it was a family member who said, you know, we've dealt with this long enough. We don't want anything Uh, to do with it. Well, you know what? You being the last person that he spoke to, Answer the phone, answer the door, and answer the fucking questions. If you are innocent, there's nothing you have to say that would, you know, cast doubt on you. If you have something to do with this, you need to tell someone. You need to come forward. Maybe it was an accident, but what you did afterward was not the way you handle something if you're innocent. If you got into a fight... You know, if if Jay came at you and something happened that you didn't want to happen, that happens. But you could explain it. When a barrel, a young man, and your camper are missing, those are things that are hard to explain, Mr. Malinowski. For two weeks. For two weeks. What did he did he say anything when he got back? Yes. One of the uh responses was that he just needed some time away. Oh, great. Did he say where he went? Uh, I That I don't know. And if that has been, um, if that's been stated, that has not been released to me. Um, obviously, the detectives may know, but I will tell you that Detective Lopez says, look, he's never been cleared and he cannot be eliminated as a suspect. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> right. Okay. So here's here's what's different in 2021. In 1993, the L.A. County DA's office had not prosecuted one nobody case. They have since then, and they are open to doing that. And they realize the world is different now and that there are ways to prove that someone did something maybe without, you know, the body. And what is so awful is that Jay's family doesn't even know what happened But they do know that he did not walk away. He did not walk away from his life. So motive. Here's where what could have happened 
and a reason behind it becomes a little more clear. Producer Mark, if you could play that clip. The former player had talked to several students and had explained that he knew that it was Jay who turned him in and that uh, he told one student that if uh, he had a chance, he'd take Jay to an alley and beat him up. So what happened was Alexander Malinowski was renting out the auditorium and pocketing the money uh, without the school supervisors or superintendents uh, knowing what was going on. So he had a side gig too, but unlike Jay's side gig, which was above board and legal, and he had wanted to borrow equipment to help make his side business more uh, responsible, more profitable, and help his mother, Alexander Malinowski's side gig was to skim money off the top of a school program for his own pockets, to line his own pockets. Nice guy. Wonderful, wonderful guy. So all I can say is that I believe we know what happened. I believe we know something bad happened. And I believe we know that Alexander Malinowski knows what that is. And I'm going to guess that there are other people that know. There was a Rosemead High School student who had seen Mr. Malinowski walking back toward the school around midnight, looking disheveled, and agitated as he was when he answered the door of the auditorium for Jay's girlfriend and mumbling to himself. And this student said, hey, uh, Mr. Malinowski, do you need a ride back to school? And he drove him back to the school where his truck was parked with the camper. And yet somehow Jay's truck was four blocks away behind a dumpster. Wonder how it got there. Wonder who drove it there and parked it there. So the only thing I can say at this point is that someone and more than one someone knows what happened to Austin J. Smith. And Detective Lopez says there is no such thing as too small of a clue. And in the words of Ellie Wiesel, what hurts the victim most is not the cruelty of the oppressor, but the silence of the bystander. If you know something... If you know anything, if you've heard anything, don't be a silent bystander. And please call the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, Cold Case Division, at 323-890-5500. And more cowbell. If you'd like to support this podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash justthetipsters.